So church, over the past few weeks, we begin a series on the letters to the churches. And, and the book of Revelation is one of those books that's often scary for a lot of, um, a lot of people. I and mean, they look at the book of Revelation, and it begins talking about the end times and the apocalypse. And people kind of get scared and nervous when it comes to Revelation. But the reality of it is, is the Bible tells us in the, in the very first chapter that we are blessed to read it. And in the beginning, three chapters, we, we see these seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches in now the country of Turkey. And they're uh, uh, letters of encouragement, but also letters of correction. And I believe this, that these letters were intended and placed in the Bible for us to look at and to view and, and to kind of be a mirror for us as the church. And we guys, we realize the church is not the building, right? Everybody says, well, the church at Branch, you know, right there on 73. The church at Branch is these individual people that are sitting here in, in these seats today. And so these letters are written to us so that we can examine our lives and look at those and realize that um, there are things that God wants us to continue to do that are good, but there's also some things that we need to correct to stay in alignment with God's will and God's blessings, right? And the other thing that we always see in God's word is God's character. And I want to ingrain that within us as we study God's word and we read the Bible, that we read the Bible and we look for God in what we're reading because God always uses his word to reveal his character to us. God wants us to see who he is, right? People tell me all the time, well, God never speaks to me. He may not speak audibly to you, but he does speak through his word. So if you're not reading his word, you're missing out on seeing who God is because God's wanting to reveal himself to you. So in these letters to the churches, we've went through three of the churches already. We read the letter to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. And today we're going to be looking at Thyatira, the church of Thyatira. And this church is probably the most exceptional church that we have studied so far. They're doing a lot of things right. And we see that in one verse that we're getting ready to read of all the good things this church is doing. But in fact, the, the, third, the church of Thyteria was actually probably the smallest. It's placed in the smallest city. Um, the, 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 the city of uh, Thyatira was actually the smallest city, probably the most least popular and least liked city. Um, this just wasn't known for a lot of commerce and things like that. We do see in, in, in the scriptures um, a lady named Lydia who was part of Paul's ministry, and she sold purple linen. She was from the city. And so that's kind of a, a point to show us a little bit about what the Bible says about this city. There's not a whole lot written throughout the books of the Bible about this city, but we do see a couple points there. But it, we're going to turn to the book of Revelations, the second chapter. And I'm going to read through the entire letter, and then we're just going to glean from that a few things this morning. I'm not going to keep you long today. But Revelations 2, um, verse 18 through 29 says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burning bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that you, your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw her into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule 
them with a rod of iron and with earthen, earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Verse 29 says, And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, all seven of these letters have that final statement in them. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we know that it's important that we hear these things. When the Bible says, if you have ears to hear, hear, he's giving you a warning. And I don't know about you guys, but for me as a teenager, I had an older sibling, and I would watch what she did wrong, and I would learn from her mistakes, and it kept me out of trouble. Or I would learn to be a little bit smarter in how I was going to do things so I wouldn't get caught. I don't encourage you to do that with the Lord, but I can tell you, you can learn from other people's mistakes. We can learn from this church and say, we don't want to go down this path. And so last week we talked about the church of Pergamum and the church of Pergamum was known as a church of compromise. They were doing things that were right, but they also allowed idolatry to come in. They were kind of straddling the fence and but it was kind of known as the church that was married to the world. And we talked about last week, we can't be married to the world. We can't straddle the fence. Satan owns the fence. We have got to separate ourselves from living according to the world's standards. And so if that church was the church of compromise, what we see here is a church that's openly allowing sin to take place and they're doing nothing about it. Everybody knows it's going on. They're doing things that are completely unbiblical and against God's word, but nobody's dealing with it. So that's kind of what we see here in this church um, that we're studying today. But I want to give you some truths out of this. And the first one is this. Jesus knows the truth about the church. Now remember, the church is not the building. The church is individuals. Jesus knows the truth about where you're at in your walk with him. He knows whether you're living right for him or not. He knows if you have a desire to serve him faithfully or not. Or he knows if you're dabbling in sin right? How's our relationship with Christ? Because some of us are, are saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm sold out, but we're not really, right? It's kind of like saying, well, yeah, I'm married, and she's my only one, but I'm doing something behind the scenes. No, that's not right. And a lot of people live for Christ that way, right? They say, oh yeah, I realize I'm the church. I'm the bride of Christ. I'm married to him, but they're, they're, they're out here sleeping around with the world. I'm telling you today, Jesus knows your heart. He sees the inward parts of our being and he knows where you're at. You may be able to fool the preacher. You may be able to fool your mama or your daddy, but you're not fooling God. And so you can come into church on Sunday morning and play the Christian, or you can come into church on Sunday morning and be the Christian, but God knows where you're at. And he will reward you accordingly to where you are at, right? So one truth that stands out through the entirety of this letter is God sees all. He commends them for having faith. I'm I'm jumping ahead. (laughs) It stands out through the entirety of this letter is God sees all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He sees it all in these churches, right? And he recognizes that. He points that out in every one of these letters. I see the good works you're doing. And then he says, but I do have some things against you. That's really scary when God has a but in his sentence, right? I see you're trying to do this, but there's some things we still need to work on, son. There's some things we need to work on, daughter. And the truth is this, God will not be, not, God will not be mocked, and he will judge our lives accordingly. See, the church in America, we have gotten to this place where we've allowed so much compromise and sin into the church because we've wanted to be relevant to the world, to reach the world. And the reality of it is, is we're not fooling God. We're not mocking God. The problem with the church today is not that we're not enough like the world. It's like, it's, it's, the problem is, is we're too much like the world. We're too much like the world. The world's looking for something different. The lost are looking for truth and light. And so often we have masked it with something else to try to make it look more like what they're used to. Can I tell you, if you're coming to church and being comfortable, there's a problem. When we come into church, the Holy Spirit should be working in our lives, convicting of us things that we did yesterday. And the week before, it should be an opportunity that when we come to church, we know, man, I need to get right with God. I'm not living quite exactly where I need to be, so I need to get a little bit closer to him. And I think every one of us have room for improvement, including myself. 
And I don't think that we have to go through life living on this edge and teetering, well, am I saved or am I not? We need to know that we're saved. I remember as a kid being raised in Assembly of God Church where the pastor preached hellfire and brimstone every Sunday, and I'm thankful for his messages. They affected my life in a positive way, but I didn't understand how God worked, and so I went through my life, and every time I slipped up and did something wrong, I thought I got saved every time I slipped up and repented. And so I was getting saved 75, 80 times a week. No, that's what I thought, but I wasn't. Right? We need that conviction again, though. I believe the church needs that kind of conviction. Because as a teenager, 14, 15 years old, I'd be hanging out with my buddies. I'd slip up and say cuss word, and instantly I was convicted and I'd repent. In church, too often we don't do that anymore. We allow things in our life that we know are unbiblical and ungodly, and yet we just compromise and say, oh, it's all right. God loves me. I'm saved. I've said that prayer, right? I got that blue mark next to my account with God. I'm in the book. But the reality of it is, is are we living for him? Are we living to please him as our Lord and Savior? And I've said this before. Too many people are like, yes, I want him to be my Savior, but they don't want him to be their Lord. And see, Jesus doesn't play one part or the other. He plays both parts. He wants to be our Savior, but he also wants us to, to know that he's our Lord. Second thing I want to tell you is this. Jesus praises this church for the good things that they've done. God sees the good things that you're doing, and he's going to reward you for being faithful to his word, for walking in obedience. Some of us, we get into church, and we're serving God, and we feel like, man, I'm just being punished. Now, God sees you. He knows what's going on. I think that's the most amazing thing to know. And it's such a simple concept, and we all know it, but do we really know it? He is watching us. Right? We used to sing a song, his eye is on the sparrow. Right? His eye is on us. He's got you figured out. He knows what's going on in your life. And it's, re- it's comforting to know that because we can turn to him and say, God, you know I'm not doing good right now. And I think if we were being honest today, and, I, and I, if I took a, a show of hands and said, how many of you guys are just not doing very good today? You guys would probably be amazed at how many hands go up. How many are you struggling with your faith? And it'd be like, oh my goodness if we were being honest. Because it's a journey. It's a walk. Right? And we go through highs and lows. We go through mountains and valleys. And God is with us through all of them. And he sees where we're at. And he's going to reward us for the good things that we've done. Thyatira seems to be the best church so far. As Jesus begins the letter, he commends them for these things. For having faith. For having love. For having patient endurance. And having spiritual growth, right? We, we go through that, them verses that we just read. And he, he lists these things that he sees. He says, I know your works. Guys, God knows your works today. He knows what you're doing. He knows whether you're living for him or not. He knows your love. What was the problem with the church of Ephesus? They forgot their first love. Thyatira had that down. They were walking in love. They knew what love was. He convinced them for their faith. That's pretty good because his his own disciples, he corrected constantly asking them, where is your faith? And this church has got faith. They've got love. They've got faith. He says, I see the service that you're doing. You're working for me. You're doing these things. He's acknowledging that. I see your patient endurance. Have you guys remember the letter to the church of Smyrna? We talked about persecution. They were struggling with persecution. This church had went through it. He said, I see your patience and your endurance through the suffering and through the struggles. You're keeping the faith and you're enduring through things. And then he goes on and says, your latter works exceed your first. They're growing. They're doing more work. They're doing more things. They're, 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 as a church, they're getting it, right? And he's acknowledging that. See, now I would, I would love that if Jesus just sent me an email today and I went back there and checked the email and it's a letter to the branch church at branch. He said, man, I see what you guys are doing. I seen you guys had a Thanksgiving dinner yesterday for the community. You may not have had a ton of people show up. Maybe there was 55 or 60 people, but you were faithful. You, you collected food boxes and you were able to send out 15 families with a food box. I see what you're doing there. I see that you guys are, I've got a kids ministry and a youth ministry going on. I see that your baby, you're dedicating babies. I seen that you're doing baptisms and I want to tell you guys you're doing a good job there. 
Right? We would love that, right? But we would want the pastor to stop when it gets to the part that gets a little bit more uncomfortable and unsettling. Right? Everybody wants their parent to pat them on the back and tell them a good job they're doing, but sometimes we really struggle with correction, right? And the Bible tells us that God as a father corrects us. A father that loves his child will correct them, right? And I believe this, that we need to be more open to correction from God's word. And so we look here in this third thing is this, Jesus exposes the evil in the church of Thyatira. He exposes the evil. How many of you guys know that God's not going to be complacent when it comes to sin in his body? Let me say that again. God's not going to be complacent when it comes to sin in his body. He's preparing the church to be his bride in heaven. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. So he's not going to allow his church to keep living in sin and doing things that's, that, that hurt and damage other people. He's going to deal with sin in our lives. Over and over throughout the New Testament when we read Scripture, we see where God is dealing with sin within his body. He's not okay with us living a double-sided life, having double standards. We're either going to live for him or we're not. In fact, if we look through the Old Testament, we see the same thing with the children of Israel, right? Over and over, the Bible tells us different things. But you look in Deuteronomy, like chapter 28, and it says, these blessings will follow those that do these things. Right? I think the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 8, blessed is the man that does this, you'll be blessed in your house, you'll be blessed in your field. Everything you do will prosper if you obey my law, right? And then you get to verse 15 and it flips. And it says, if you don't obey my law, what's going to happen? These curses are going to be up on your life. Some of us are going through battles and things in our life, not because God's punishing us, but because we have made choice to continue to live in sin and we're suffering through the consequences of our sin. And you guys are not shouting down very good today, but that's okay. Pray for me. I'm under persecution. Pray for me. The devil's really beating me up. Now you're living with consequences of your stupid decisions. You know what God's word says. You know that he's a just God, right? Aren't you glad that God's a just judge? Some of us, we want, we want him to have mercy, mercy, mercy all the time. But the reality of it is, one part of God's character is, is he is a just judge. What does that mean? Okay, think of that person that you love dearly. Maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your daughter, maybe it's your grandmother. They're going down the highway. This drunk driver, jacked up on meth. He's flying down the highway. He doesn't have a license. He lost his license years ago. He's driving a car that he stole. It don't have insurance. It don't have license. And he hits that person you love. Day of judgment comes, right? He stands before the judge. And the, he's looking at the judge, and the judge looks down at him. What do you have to say? Well, your honor, can I explain something? And he proceeds to tell about his life, how he had done great things in his life. He had worked at a homeless shelter. He used to, used to be the guy on the other side of the fence. He used to help people in recovery. And then one day, his wife got cancer and died, and he fell off the bandwagon, and he just couldn't help himself. And he turned to the bottle, and he turned to the drugs. And just in a moment of rage, he stole this vehicle. But judge, have mercy on me. Forgive me. And the judge says, you know what? You sound like you're a pretty good guy. You just got on the wrong track. I'm just going to go ahead and let you go. Was he being just to you by letting that guy go? No. You want, you want justice for your mom. You want justice for your grandma. That bottle of water is not going to stay there. You want justice for your baby, right? And God's just that way. But so many of us go through our life living in sin, playing the harlot with our lifestyle, and with our faith, and then we want to cry out to Jesus every little bit, have me mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Well, there's going to be a time of judgment, the Bible says. And we have time right now to cry mercy. We have time to come before the Lord, and he's faithful in giving us mercy and grace. Amen? But the day is going to come where you better have your life right with him, because there's going to be a day where he lays that aside, and he says, today is the day I judge. Today I'm going to be just. And the Bible tells us that there is coming a day 
where every one of us are going to stand before God, give an account for our life. Church, this isn't an easy message to preach. This isn't one that's going, I'm going to get a lot of pats on the back, say you did a good job. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to preach the truth this morning because, church, we need to get our life in line with God. Because we say all the time, oh, he's coming back soon. We say life is precious. It's just a vapor. It could pass away tomorrow, but we don't live that way. We say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. If you really believe in God, why are you living the way you're living? Why are you allowing idolatry into your life? Why are you allowing sexual immorality in your life? Why are you allowing sin to your life when you know God's word speaks against it? We see in this third point, Jesus exposes the evil that is in that church. And do you think he's not going to do the same to us? He will. So the evil that he speaks about in the church of Thyatira, he speaks about this prophetess who's a false prophetess named Jezebel. And she comes in and they just basically follow everything she says. So I want to read a few things I found online that I thought spoke to this. Somehow in the midst of their growth, the believers at Thyatira had allowed ungodly woman to rise to a place of enormous spiritual influence. There are many mysteries here that the text does not explain. Who was this woman and how did she rise to prominence in an otherwise excellent congregation? Our Lord clearly refers to a real person, even though the name Jezebel is likely not her real name, but rather an allusion to the wicked wife of King Ahab. The crafty Jezebel became a symbol for a seductive form of evil that not only allowed for idolatry, but promoted it. And not only allowed adultery, but encouraged and rewarded it. But how could such a woman come to power in the church at Thyatira? I think the answer is in the word prophetess. By claiming to speak for God, she she gained credibility with gullible, untaught Christians. One could imagine that such a woman combined a powerful personality with persuasive speech, a seductive smile, and withering scorn for her critics. She was no doubt clever, quick on her feet, slick in her presentation, and extremely dangerous. And she did it all under the guise of being a good Christian. No doubt her followers filled the pews at Thyatira. It worked for the first Jezebel in the Old Testament, and it worked for her namesake in Thyatira. Now we read this passage here, this letter And we think about Jezebel, and we just kind of blush brush that off. But the reality of it was, and the reality of it is, is Satan has got his workers in the church. Satan is going to send evil workers in the church that are deceptive, that are going to speak against God's word, and are going to do it in such a way, they have such a charisma about them, that the people will fall for it. And we have a warning here as a church that we need to make sure that we first know who God is, that we're led by his spirit, that we know his word so that we can recognize these evil spirits, to recognize these false prophets or prophetesses. Because this woman came in and somehow convinced this church that these things that they were doing were going to be all right. It was all right to eat meat that was offered to false idols. It was all right to participate in sexual immorality. Can I tell you, we're living in a time in 2023 where we're not far from that in the church. There are denominations that are turning their back on God's word and what God's word says about sexual things. And they're saying, well, we're going to rewrite that or we're going to put this twist on and say, well, that's not what really what God meant. I don't think that that's really what God was saying. I don't think God really meant Male or female. As long as you love each other, it's okay. Right? We've seen this happen in our culture today. The institute of marriage has been so distorted and twisted. Well, you don't really have to get married. You don't really have to make that covenant. God knows your heart. He knows what you've been through. You guys are, as long as you guys are faithful to one another, you're okay. That's not what God's word says, though. But there are thousands of Christians in America that believe that. It's okay to be gay and go to church and serve in the church. You can be a preacher and be gay. That's not what God's word says. And I know there's some people getting upset right now. Their feathers are just fluffling. But you know what? God's word's truth. Let man be a liar because God's word's truth. We need to hear this today, church. 
Because God sees our works. He sees what we're trying to do with his word. And he's going to judge it someday. He is going to bring correction one of these days. Did you notice the first part of this letter? It talks about who Jesus was to this church. And every time that we read one of those letters, and I haven't touched on this too much, it, it defines it in just a little bit different way. Verse 18 says, And the angel of the third church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God. So it's very specific to this church. This is Jesus. This is God speaking to you. This isn't man's opinion. This isn't a man coming in trying to give you counsel or try to tell you, if you want your church to be better, you need to do this. This is coming directly from God himself. And he says this about it. The word of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. Do you realize fire is a purifier? It's a cleanser, right? God's looking at this church with fire in his eyes. What's he doing? He's getting ready to cleanse the church. I don't know about you guys, but I think the church in America needs a cleansing. I think it's time that we get back on track and get right with God. That we forsake our worldly ways. That we quit listening to businessmen tell us how to run the church. And we go back to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in what we need to do to grow a church. His feet are like burnished bronze, it says. What's he going to do with his feet of burnished bronze? He's going to step out the ways of the enemy. He exposes the evil in, this, in, the, in the church of Thyatira, and he will expose the evil in every church that goes against him and opposes him. He wants his church to be righteous and holy. He commends them for, being, for doing good things. He commends them for their righteous acts, but then he condemns them for the evil. That's going on. And then we go on and we see this. Not everyone in that church was participating in the evil. Do you know it's important who you're sitting next to in church? It's important what we allow in the doors of the church. Right? Everybody's welcome. But after a while, if you're going to try to play the world and the church, something is going to have to give. It's true. You can't be dealing drugs on Monday and come to church on Sunday and expect things are going to be all right. God's going to deal with it. And if the church leaders don't deal with it, then God's going to deal with it himself. Right? You can't go out and have a, a, a drunken brawl every Saturday night and then come to church on Sunday and want to get up and do the announcements. It don't work that way. The fourth thing I want to tell you is this. Jesus will justly judge. And we talked about this. Verse 23 says, he will search the mind and the heart and judge according to our works. He's going to search it out. He's going to judge it. Fifth thing is this, Jesus encouraged his faithful followers. He wants to encourage us. He wants us to keep going forward. Verses 24 through 28 again says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, right? They don't hold to these false teachings. Who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Wouldn't that be scary to think that the deep things of Satan are being taught in the church? He says, you don't do these things, so I do not lay any more burdens on you. Only hold fast what you have until I come. He says, I'm not going to put any more burdens on you that are being righteous. Those of you that are walking according to my way, I'm not going to burden you with any more things. Just keep the faith. Hold fast, stay strong, endure through the hardship. Some of you have been in church for years. You've been faithfully serving God. You've been walking with God. You have forsaken the old ways. You have forsaken the old man. And God is telling you today, keep holding on. It will be worth it. Keep the faith. You're not missing out on what's going on in the world. You're living for him and he's going to reward you for it. So hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my word until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. What is he saying? I've got a reward for you in heaven. i got a position, a promotion for you in heaven if you just keep the faith, that you just hold on. See, some of us, we're, we're living for this world. We're saying we're living for Christ. This world is just a little glimpse, Right? It's just preparation for what's to come. Because there's an eternity on the other side of our death. 
Right? The Bible tells us that there's going to be a, a choice that we've got to make whether we're going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. And hell's going to be a place of eternal damnation and punishment. But heaven is going to be a place prepared for the saints of God who believe in Him and who are saved and called according to His purpose. And we're not just going to be up there all dancing around the altar 24-7, right? Because there's not going to be any time. It's eternal. But there's going to be work for us to do. And he says, I'm going to put you in a position of authority over nations, those of you that hold fast and keep the faith. He's going to rewarding us accordingly in heaven. Some of us are like, I don't care about the rewards. I do because when I get my reward, you know what I want to do? I want to take it and I want to lay it at the foot of Jesus. Some of us are like, man, I'm just, I just want to get there. I don't care how I get there. If I get there by the skin of my teeth, all I got to do is make it one step into the gate. No. God wants us to do better than that, right? He's got places and positions of authority for those that keep the faith. He said, I'll give him the morning star. He's going to reward those that are faithful. See, I think sometimes we get distracted in this world as believers. Why? Because the world screams at it and mocks us. You're foolish. You're missing out. The world tells us, you're crazy. What if you spend your entire life believing those things and you die and you realize that you were a fool and you made a complete mistake? What if I do? What have I hurt anybody by following Christ and being faithful to His Word? I've lived a good life. I've lived a moral life. I've done the right thing. I felt good about the way I've treated people. I've been generous. I've helped others. I didn't go out and do evil things. I didn't abuse my body by drugs and alcohol and all this crazy stuff. I've lived for God. What if I did miss it? What if it's all fake? Oh, well. But what if I'm right today? What if I'm preaching is truth today? What if God's word is true and it's been tested and proven that it is? And this life ends. And I'm faced, facing the judge. And he looks at me and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest that I have and place I've prepared for you. See, I don't want to stand before the judge and go, man, I should have done better. I don't want to stand before the judge and go, I should have took God more serious. Man, all these things that I, I've done the past 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, I could have done better. I could have reached more people. How about you guys? I think about those things. It's not just about what I've done, but what about the other people in my life? What if I go to heaven and my family goes to hell? What if I go to heaven and my neighbor goes to hell? Do we care if people perish? Do we care if people perish? Do we care if people go to hell? We should. There's an old hymn that says, if men go to hell, who cares? But I, I read in the book in John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world enough to send his son to die on a cross because he didn't want one person to perish. Do we care, church? When we drive through the city and we see a homeless beggar that's got a bottle of alcohol in his hand and you know he's broken and lost, do we care? Because there's churches out here, we have a mentality. We don't care about the lost. I've talked to Christians. Well, then people deserve what they get. You start talking about Muslims. Oh, my goodness. They blew up our, our trade center. The hell with all of them. Now, that's not the way we should be, church. That's not the way we should be. Jesus died on the cross for that Muslim just like he died for you. For that alcoholic, that drug addict. Some of you guys were there. You know what I'm talking about. He died for you. He tra transformed your life for a reason and a purpose. See, we want to judge people based on the things they do. And the reality of it is, is some of the things they're doing is because they're broken inside. We're putting labels on people, and the reality of it is, is we don't know what they've went through. What we should be seeing is that's a person that needs Jesus. That's a person that just needs to understand who God is. That's a person that needs to experience the love of God. Because I believe this, we talked about this earlier, I believe it's the grace of God that many of us are not in a lost and broken world today. 
that we're saved, that we're not out on the street doing drugs. And those Christians that get on their little high horses and say, well, I would never do drugs. You better watch out. I would never drink. You better watch out. The Bible says be careful lest when you think you stand, you fall. We better be careful, church. It is only by the grace of God we're saved. But He has called and saved us to do good works for Him. To live holy before Him. We are supposed to be the light of the world. And when we allow sin in our life, we dim that light. We darken that light. Man, these seven letters have been hard. We only got through four of them. We ain't even finished with the fourth one yet. The church of Thyatira had a lot of things going. It looked like a great church. But they had some things they had to deal with. They had some things that they had to confront. And I believe we live in a time in 2023 where we don't like confrontation. We don't want to confront anybody, right? We want everybody to feel welcome. But the reality of it is, is Jesus is going to confront it. Jesus is going to confront it. All right, there's this, this teaching that goes through the church today. Well, Jesus just loves us all. It's okay. Jesus does love us all, but it's not okay to keep living that lifestyle. He loves us enough to pull us out of the pit. Right? Anybody remember those, those old-time preachers preaching about being down in the pit? And he brought me out of the pit. And he set me on the... Come on, you guys remember those days? Back when Pentecostal people were actually Pentecostal, and you'd be shouting me down for preaching that way? We need to get back to those days again. The reality of it is, God didn't just say, okay, you got a free ticket to heaven. You just keep living like hell down there. It'll be all right. When you get to heaven, I'll clean you up. No, he wants to clean you up on earth to prepare you for heaven. He wants to prepare you for heaven. This place is a preparation for you to get to heaven. God is not all right with his bride living out in the world and acting like the world. He has called you to be set apart. He's called you to be holy. He's called you to separate yourself from those things. And there's no gray area, guys. Right? We could have those conversations today. We could just sit here and go, what about this? The Bible really doesn't talk about this, and the Bible really doesn't talk about that. There's no gray areas. I look at the book of Hebrews. I believe it's the 11th chapter. He says, lay aside every weight and sin that easily besets you. Right? I made a comment last week in a sermon. I said, you know what? I don't think drinking a beer will send you to hell. And I stand by that statement. But the reality of it is, drinking a beer may not be a sin, but it definitely could be a weight in your life cause you to, to slip and to fall into an addiction that will lead you to hell. Right? Some of the things that we allow in our life, we're just riding the grace train. Well, it's all right because I'm saved by grace. But it may not be a sin in your life, but it's a weight and it's not helping you in your walk with the Lord. Come on. We all know what it is. We know those things in our life. right? I'm not reading your book. I'm reading my book as I'm preaching this. There's some things in my life that are probably a weight that are hindering my walk with God that I need to deal with, and every one of us has got them. right? I'm not going to stand here and call your sin out today. I'm just going to tell you, God knows it. I don't have to call it out. I don't have to prophesy today and tell every one of you what you got going on in your life because i got to work on my own life. But you need to work on yours. You need to look, what is this thing that I need to deal with? And it could be a numerous amount of things. Because what happens is, I think with many of us who've been in church for years and walked with the Lord for years, we get to a place where we think we don't sin anymore. We think we've become so righteous that everything's good, but we don't realize we're gossiping, we're backbiting, we're living in pride. We have envy in our heart toward people. We have jealousy in our heart toward people. We're bitter toward people. We have unforgiveness. You know, those things will send you to hell too. Oh, preacher, don't, let's not talk about those today. Let's talk about those people in the world that are drinking and doing drugs. Let's not talk about the gossipers. Let's not talk about the backbiters. Let's not talk about the envy and the jealousy. Let's not talk about the fit of rage we have at home. Is sin not sin in God's eyes? You don't think God's going to judge you on that too? Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I'm getting ready to end. It's about time for me to stop. I've been in ministry 20 years. I was a youth pastor for several of those years. 
And you know what amazes me? Is people will come in and they'll play church. And boy, they can fool everybody in the church. And they think they got God fooled. I remember being a part of a church 20 years ago. The children's church pastor was a very good friend of mine. He had over 100 kids in his kids' ministry. That's somebody that's got anointing on their life if they can have 100 kids show up on Sunday morning just for kids' ministry. And the kids were growing, and they were praying for one another. And I went to his house one day. I was invited to his house. And he said, let me tell you, Isaiah, he goes, the hardest part about kids' ministry is not the kids. He goes, it's the part where we take up prayer requests every Sunday, and we ask prayer. Who, who has a prayer request? And he goes, there's a family of five kids that go to our church. Their dad's on the worship team, stands beside me. He goes, I play the guitar. He plays the bass. You know who I'm talking about. He's a police officer at the local police station. And his five kids raise their hand, pray that dad stops beating mom and me as kids. Because dad beats, beats us all the time. You don't think God sees that? You think that you're going to get by the grace of God because you play the bass guitar on Sunday morning and you're nice to the preacher? God was nice to the preacher. And you're going to get him to heaven. You don't think God's going to have his way? I'll tell you how nice the guy was to the preacher. The preacher in that church, this is something that I have been amazed for years. The preacher had an old Mazda pickup that had almost 350,000 miles on it. The back glass had been broke out one side of it and had cardboard over it. And that preacher would pull on Sunday morning and he'd park across the street in the farthest parking lot from the church and he'd walk to the building. The preacher was so humble that he would park over there and make sure that he was the farthest from everybody else. And he drove that truck. And one day, this guy come in and he said, Pastor, he goes, I went and bought a brand new truck this week. We're talking 2003. He bought a 2004 Dodge Ram crew cab, four-wheel drive pickup. And he said, I was driving home from the dealership and God told me, Pastor, I'm supposed to trade you trucks. So here's the key to my truck. You drive my truck, I'll drive yours. But he beats his wife and kids. He ain't fooling God. Do you think he's going to stand before God on judgment day? Well, well, I give the preacher a new truck, but you beat your wife and kids. God sees those things. I'll tell you one more story, and then we're going to end here. There's a youth pastor at a church, walked in on a Wednesday night. We had 45, 50 kids coming. And I got ready to, to do my lesson. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, there's somebody in this room that if they don't get prayer tonight, they won't be here next week. And I knew what that meant. It wasn't they're not going to be here because they're going to play a sports game. They're not going to be here on this earth next week if we don't pray. I felt it in my spirit so strong. And I stopped and I said, I don't know who this is, but God just spoke to me and he said, there's somebody here. If they don't come forward and get prayer tonight, they won't be here next week. And you know what that means. I'm standing right between two rows. Brother sitting over here, sister sitting over here. The brother looks at the sister, sister looks at him. They get up, teenage kids, holding hands and walk up to me. Brother and sister, you tell me two teenage kids that would do that. These two did. Tears in both of them's eyes, running down their face. The girl begins speaking to me. She goes, last night, she goes, I took a bottle of pills. She goes, I had in my hand. I had the cap off. I was getting ready to take him down. And my brother walked by and he saw me. He ripped him out of my hands. She goes, the family that you see on Sunday morning that walks in with smiles is not the family that we live with throughout the week. She goes, my mom and dad, I know they're the assistant worship leaders. I know they do the music on Sunday nights, but they don't live it throughout the week. God sees, guys. God sees. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your life. He knows what you're doing throughout the week. He placed me as a pastor here, what? To shepherd and to love you guys to help guide you guys in the right path. You can deceive me, but you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Because God sees it. He knows it. And he's going to deal with it. I don't know about you guys, that scares me. Because it reminds me of a child. When I was a kid, I was Andre. I did some really dumb things. And my mom would get a hold of me. And she'd say, you wait till your dad gets home. Anybody ever heard that before? And I knew what was coming when dad got home. It scared me. When dad got home, I was getting a whooping, right? And dad, in his loving way, a lot of times would tell me, go prepare for the whooping. 
And that doesn't mean put 14 pairs of underwear on and put a hard back book back there because it gets you even whooped even harder. But when it said, Dad, you wait till Dad gets home, it's coming, right? You knew. Okay, I got away with it for a little bit, but now it's coming. Some of us have been living a double standard life saying we're living for God, but we're dabbling in the world and we're, we're going, you know what, I'm doing this and I don't care what anybody else thinks. You better care what God thinks because the day's coming. The day's coming. And when Dad shows up, it's not going to be a pretty sight. Anybody ever got a whooping? And why dad or mom's trying to whoop, you're trying to dance, right? Before they hit you, you put on the, the waterworks, <laughs> right? You just kind of fall to your knees, just like melt like a crown underneath the fire. It doesn't help, does it? It's not going to help when we stand before God either, right? He may not be using a wooden paddle, but he's going to judge justly. And he's going to give us our reward. Not because he's a mean God, but because he loves us enough, he's going to let us make the choice how we're going to live. See, God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves to hell. Because we make that choice. We choose to reject God. We choose to live for the world. We know what God's word says. He's given us warning throughout his word. But we make the choice that we would rather have the world than God. And so the day's going to come we're going to stand before God, and he's going to look at our life. And he goes, you've got your reward. It's hell. It's right over there. It's what you've been asking me for years. You wanted to live in, you wanted to live in the world? People of the world are right over there. Go ahead. It's pretty scary, ain't it? Or he's going to look at you and say, you know what? I've seen your works. I've seen how you were faithful. I've seen that you had love. I've seen that you were, had patience and endured. Your reward's right over there. Enter through those golden gates. There's something special over there. We get to choose. We get to choose. If you bow your heads with me for a moment. I just want to give everybody here an opportunity to respond to this message. I know it's the message that God's laid on my heart to give in this season and this hour. And the first thing I want to do is I want to talk to people that are here today and they know that their life is not right with God. They know they're living in sin. They know there's things in their life that if God called them home today, they would be damned to hell. If that's you today, and you say, I want to be different. I want to make a covenant today with God, and I want to choose to accept salvation, and I want to walk with Him. If that's you today, if God's speaking to you, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. If that's you, would you raise your hand in faith and say, today, I want to receive salvation. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. I see those hands. You're here. You raised your hands in faith. God's working. I ain't going to call you to an altar today. I believe God can meet you where you're at. Right where you're at right now. I'm going to say a prayer, and I want everybody to repeat it after me because we're going to, we're going to join beside our brothers and sisters right now. We've got four or five hands that was raised this morning. That's all you need to know. There's four or five hands right here. That's I, it's time for me to get my life right with God. So we're going to say this prayer. So repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I've heard your word. I felt your spirit, and I know that my life is not right with you. I realize that if I was to die right now, I'd go to hell. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. I repent of my ways. I want to walk for you. I want to live this life to please you, Lord. And I want to receive the reward of heaven when I die. So, Lord, give me the strength to lay aside my evil ways. Help me to die to the old man today. Father, today I choose to live for you. Thank you for your spirit that you've placed in my life right now. I thank you that your son died on the cross so that I could be free. 
And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm thankful for bold people that would raise their hand and admit that God's working in their life. Thankful for that. Now I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. But the Bible tells us this. When one sinner comes to Christ, the angels of heaven are celebrating and rejoicing. And I want to have celebration with you today. If you're bold enough, you raised your hand, you said that prayer, and you meant it in faith, would you stand up and walk up here, and I want to shake your hand as my brother or sister in Christ. Would you do that today? And will we celebrate with him? Can we celebrate today? Amen. 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 We're celebrating today. Yes. God's working all over you. I see it. Now turn around. Your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We celebrate with them today. Amen. They made a covenant with God in prayer just a minute ago. You guys remember the baby dedication a while ago and I made you guys do a covenant too? Same thing happens right here. When you're a new believer, you surrender your life to God, what happens next? The devil comes with all the hell and demons he can to try to knock them off the track. And what do we have to do? To pray them, to encourage them, to support them. To help them dust off when they fall down because a new believer always falls down every once in a while. Church, we love you guys. You're the church. We love you guys. We're here for you. If you need anything, let us know. We want to encourage you in your faith. Amen? All right. You guys can be seated. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but it's been a good day in the house of the Lord. You can't ask for much of a better day than today. God's working and He's moving. I feel His Holy Spirit. There are some of us here that didn't respond to an altar this morning. You know what? It's all right. I don't have to put you on the spot. But I'm going to tell you what to do. Because I know you've got a reputation to keep, right? Here's what you do. When you get in your car and you get home, go in your bedroom and shut the door and fall flat on your face and just fall and talk to the Lord. Because He'll meet you there in your bedroom. He saved me in the woods with a 22 rifle and a Bible in my hand. He can meet you at home too. The main thing is, is you get it right with God. You don't have to get it right with branch assembly. You don't have to get it right with preacher. Get it right with God. Let God work in your life. Amen. Been good, yes. Brother Patrick, would you close us out in prayer?